Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you this morning, right? And I wish to thank Ms. Manita Seigel and her team at the HR division of the DPS Society for inviting me to make this webinar presentation. Today's session is so different from the traditional seminars you've attended before in your own schools. A webinar by definition happens over the net. So it's virtual and might I add, surreal. All of you can see me, I assume, but I can't see you though I know you're all there. And importantly, you can simply sit in your computer chairs and doze while I, I have to stay completely awake and talk about the teaching of poetry. Might I remind you, therefore, that as an audience, you have to be participatory. Given the constraints of interacting with a large webinar audience like this, I'm going to do my best to draw you into being participatory. Right, very briefly, this is my plan. I'm going to first talk about literature in general, the value of teaching literature in an English classroom. I'll then discuss why we need to teach poetry specifically in our English language classrooms. And in the third phase, I'll do a little bit of uh, a demonstration lesson, if I might call that. It's all going to be very unreal because I don't have you with me interacting all the time, but we'll do our best. So in the third phase, I'll actually present a plan for the teaching of a poem, a plan that I have uh, used over the years. And it seems to work when I uh, recommend it to teachers. So I'll share that with you later. Right, so let's begin. I sent you a handout titled Literariness in Language, containing two texts, text A and text B. Could you now please take it out? Take it out of your folders, your files. This is what it'll look like. Okay. Literariness in language. Text A. When you make a call, this is what you do. First, check the code, if any, and number. Lift the receiver and listen for dialing tone, a continuous purring. Dial carefully and allow the dial to return freely. Then wait for another tone. Ringing tone, burr, and the number is being called. Engage tone, a repeated single note. Try again a few minutes later, and so on. Right? And I'm, I'm going down to the bottom of uh, the, uh, the first text. When you answer the telephone, always give your name or telephone number. If you hear a series of rapid pips, the calls coming from a coin box telephone. Wait until the pip stops, and then give your name or telephone number. You'll notice that the text tells you how to use a telephone. The kind of telephone we used several decades ago, by the way, which we dial with our index finger to make local calls and trunk calls, particularly from coin-operated telephone booths. It's a prose text, 
an instructional prose text, as you'd expect, there are a number of imperatives. I'm sure you've taught imperatives in the classroom under primer. Imperatives like check the code, lift the receiver, listen for dialing tone, dial carefully, and so on. The instructions are clear and unambiguous. They mean what they say. You would not therefore want to use your skills of interpretation to look for an underlying meaning in this text. Now look at XB. <clears throat> In homes, a haunted apparatus sleeps that snores when you pick it up. If the ghost cries, they carry it to their lips and soothe it to sleep with sounds. And yet, they wake up deliberately by tickling with a finger. Now, this is from a well-known poem written in 1970 by Craig Rain, and the title of that poem is A Martian Sends a Postcard Home. Right? Did you notice that this text does not even mention the word telephone? And yet, it's evidently a description of the instrument. The description itself is a Martian perspective. An alien from Mars is trying to make sense of an earthly gadget. He or she, or it, notices the telephone and observes how it is to be used by human beings. Now, no human being would want to use the Martian's observations as a set of instructions for using a telephone. Given a choice, you choose text A if you wish to operate a telephone. But if you wanted to go beyond the prosaic to deploy your faculties of imagination and skills of interpretation, you choose text B. Text A does not tease your creative buds. So you're not likely to return to it once you've un internalized the instructions. But text B has qualities that would make you return to it frequently because it affords extraordinary intellectual pleasure. In essence, text B is a poem that has typical features of literariness. Uh, before we discuss the teaching of poetry, let's think about literature in general. What is literature? Here are five famous quotations on literature from a well-known book, Literature and Language Teaching by Gillian Lazar, which she wrote in 1993. This quotation. Literature could be said to be a sort of disciplined technique for arousing certain emotions. The interesting phrase there is disciplined technique. So it's a technique that any one of us can possibly use if we wished to produce a literary text but for us to be good, proficient literature people, creative writers, then a great deal of training and practice will go into it, which is why we say discipline technique. But what do we use this for? We use it to arouse emotions. So think about text B. 
right? So that is literature. Second quotation. <coughs> Sorry. Great literature is simply charged with meaning to the utmost possible degree. Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound was a contemporary mentor, friend of T.S. Eliot and a critic. Now what's Pound saying here? Pound is saying all of us use language, but the difference between literary language and every other kind of language is that this kind of literary language has something infused into it, right? And he calls it meaning. And there's so much of meaning in it that you can keep unraveling it year after year, decade after decade, century after century. Third quotation. Practical language is used for acts of communication while literary language has no practical function at all and simply makes us see differently. In other words, basically, there is no linguistic difference, as it were, between text A and text B, which we began with. Both contain language. But the difference is, when you use literary language, then it ceases to have a practical function, right? But what it does is to make us see the world differently. It makes us see ourselves differently. Quotation number four. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Practical language. Sorry, I'll, I'll get back to that. Right. Fourth quotation. If I pore over the railway timetable, not to discover a train connection, but to stimulate in myself general reflections on the speed and complexity of modern existence, then I might be said to be reading it as literature. Interesting, isn't it? What Eagleton saying here is, you can actually use any text that you come across for literary purposes, except that when it is to be turned into a source of literariness, then things begin to take a different perspective. Because with a railway timetable, it has a clear utilitarian purpose. You open a railway timetable, locate the departure and arrival timings of the train you're interested in, how often it uh, takes off in a week, etc. And you put it away. You store away that knowledge or you book a ticket straight away. But with a person who's looking at the same text, it's possible, that's all he's saying, he's saying not that you should do it all the time, it's possible <clears throat> to use the same railway timetable to think about the speed of existence, the complexity of modern existence, which didn't exist, say, 150 years ago. <clears throat> Probably the best quotation. Literature is the question minus the answer. What does that mean? Roland Barthes is saying, <clears throat> a literary text raises questions, but it doesn't give you the answers. Right? 
the answers to the questions that a literary text raises have to be provided by the reader. So each reader, therefore, will respond to the issues in a literary text in terms of their own experience, their own expectations, in terms of what we call their own background knowledge. So what we carry to a literary text determines how much we get out of the text. As I said, these are extracts from uh, Lazar's book, Literature and Language Teaching. Right. Hardcore teachers of language have sometimes questioned the inclusion of literary texts in an English curriculum. That's relevant uh, to the CBSE system in particular, because I assume you still have something called a literature reader, apart from a main course book and an activity book uh, or workbook. Right now, the CBSE curriculum you're following now was prepared between 1987 and 1992 with a team of specialists comprising uh, two or three senior teachers of English from central schools, two or three of us from CIE FL, and a couple of representatives from the British Council. And I still remember two or three of uh, those specialists did not want literature to continue in the new curriculum because they said we are moving towards a communicative mode of teaching, right? We're talking about communicative language teaching in the new curriculum. And why should we have literature? Let's use texts that will have a practical purpose. Luckily, two or three of us, which included me, we said no, nothing doing. We want literature to continue, but with a clear focus. We want teachers to understand why we use literature in the first place. And that's the reason it's still there in the curriculum. Now, People who object to the inclusion of literature in the language classroom have some objections. Their principal objections to literature rest on the argument that the overriding aim of teaching English is to develop the learner's communicative competence, not to produce creative writers, mm -hmm. and that literature is a luxury that an English curriculum can ill afford. Gillian Lazar lists six reasons that put these objections to rest. She argues that we should teach literature in the form of poetry, drama, fiction, and other literary genres in the English language classroom for six significant reasons. I'll run through them quickly. why we should teach literature. One, it's a stimulus for language acquisition. Once you get hooked on literature as a learner, you're going to read more literary texts. And the more you read, the larger your word hoard is going to be, the more complex your grammatical competence will, be, will become. So clearly, this is one of the many stimuli that we can use for acquiring language itself. Importantly, literature develops students' interpretative abilities. To go back to text A, the first text we looked at, there's no way you're going to try interpreting how to use a telephone. But 
you will be obliged to use text B for deploying your interpretative abilities. Because if you don't, it's like any other text. It's no longer literary. Three, it's fun and students enjoy it, right? You'll notice that if you teach literature well, students actually are more motivated to sit in on your class, to learn from you, and research supports this. And therefore, the pleasure perspective, the pleasure aspect, the fun aspect, the delight aspect, is one more reason why we should teach literature. Number four, it's highly valued literature and has a high status. I'm sure those of you, in fact, all of you have been to college. Some of you must have uh, gone on to do your masters and a few of you may have gone on to do your PhDs, research degrees in literature. And you must have noticed when you were in college and university that the persons who received the greatest attention for the right reasons were the ones who had a PhD, let's say, or a research degree or training in literature. And if that person or persons happen to be products of, um, let's say, Oxford, Cambridge or London, then their status in your eyes actually went up. So even today, somebody who specializes in literature is given special recognition. Number five, literature expands students' language awareness. In other words, quite simply, let's think of just vocabulary. When you have a word like rope, right, R-O-P-E, and you look at it basically as something that you have at home, it's a piece of rope. And you use rope to do a variety of things, particularly to pack whatever you put into a parcel, right? Or sometimes you use a rope to hang up your washing. But the word rope in the context of capital punishment takes on a sinister meaning. So for the executioner, the hangman, the word rope means something very, very different, right? So in the Nirbhaya hanging that happened a couple of months ago, when all four of the murderers were actually hanged to death, the rope was the chief mechanism. Sixth, it encourages students to talk about their opinions and feelings. This perhaps is the most important reason why we should have literature in the classroom. Because once you bring in literary texts to the classroom, you're telling children, look, the floor is yours. You read this text with some help from me and respond to it in terms of your own experience. And as a result, you'll notice you're talking about opinions that you perhaps never actually verbalized before. You'll probably realize you're now having feelings that weren't stirred by other kinds of writing. And this, as I said, is also from literature and language teaching. Right. <clears throat> Since we began by referring to a telephone, let me read out a celebrated poem on racial prejudice by the Nigerian Nobel laureate Woli Soinka. Telephone conversation. I'm sure some of you have read it. 
telephone conversation by Soenka, which he wrote in 1963, somewhere in the suburbs of London. Now it's a conversation on the telephone in England between a white landlady and the speaker, in this case, a black African-American man. The speaker has seen the landlady's advertisement in the newspaper and calls her from a telephone kiosk to ask if she'll rent out her apartment to him. Here's the poem. Telephone conversation. The price seemed reasonable. Location indifferent. The landlady swore she lived off premises. Nothing remained but self-confession. Madam, I want. I hate a wasted journey. I'm African. Silence. Silence transmission of pressurized good breeding. Voice when it came, lipstick coated, long gold rolled cigarette holder pipped. Caught I was foully. How dark? I had not misheard. Are you light or very dark? But be but nay, stench of rancid breath of public hide and speak, red booth, red pillar box, red double tiered omnibus, squelching tar. It was real. Shamed by ill mannered silence, surrender pushed dumbfounded to beg simplification. Considered she was varying the emphasis. Are you dark or very light? Revelation came. You mean like plain or milk chocolate? Her accent was clinical, crushing in its slight impersonality. Rapidly, wavelength adjusted, I chose West African sepia. And as an afterthought added, down in my passport. Silence for spectroscopic flight of fancy till truthfulness changed her accent hard on the mouthpiece. What's that? Conceding, don't know what that is. Like brunette. That's dark, isn't it? Not altogether. Facially, I'm brunette, but madam, you should see the rest of me. Palm of my hand, soles of my feet are a peroxide blonde. Friction caused foolishly, madam, by sitting down has turned my bottom raven black. Oh, one moment, madam, one moment, sensing her receiver rearing on the thunderclap about my ears. Madam, I pleaded, wouldn't you rather see for yourself? Well, Soenka's poem continues to be relevant to India. And at this point of time, most relevant to George Floyd's United States of America, Black Lives Matter. In India, don't we hear of house owners not wanting to rent out their houses or flats to African students? Or people who belong to a certain community? Or quite simply people who are non-vegetarian? Now, let's specifically shift our attention to poetry. All of you have been teaching poetry at various levels. Have you seriously asked yourselves why you're teaching poems in the first place? If you have, you'll agree with the three most popular reasons for teaching poetry. And here they are. One, <clears throat> poetry can enrich the aesthetic sensibilities of language learners. The essential word there is aesthetic sensibilities, aesthetic. It's poetry that helps young people and you and me Look at the beauty of the world around us. 
It's that aesthetic sensibility that makes us wonder at how some people are so good natured, right? And if the source of that acknowledgement comes from a literary text, we'll have to say it's poetry that made me look at nature differently, look at life differently, look at my friends differently. Poems can stimulate learners' imagination. This is the easiest way of getting young people to be creative, to be imaginative, to let their imaginations run riot. We'll come to this a little later. And the third reason poems um, can reinforce their sense of speech rhythm. Right? So when we speak English, there's a certain rhythm in the way educated speakers uh, use the language. There's a certain way in which native speakers, for instance, use English, and there is a noticeable, perceptible rhythm. So as part of our teaching English, one of the things that we pass on almost unconsciously is aspects of speech rhythm, natural speech rhythm. Now, let me elaborate the three statements. A good poem not only has the potential to apply, uh, sorry, to appeal to different learners in totally different ways, but can be made accessible in the classroom on varying levels of meaning. That is, in a mixed ability English class, the teacher can use the same poem to develop different layers of understanding and appreciation in learners of varying proficiency levels. Essentially then, we're saying that a piece of work created by a literary craftsperson can mean different things to different readers. Now, look at this red rose. A few of you, I'm sure, immediately thought of Robert Burns's poem. Robert Burns's very famous love poem, published in 1794, where it begins with the two lines, My love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Right? So for Burns, a red rose was a symbol of passionate, romantic love. Now look at this bouquet of roses, red roses. To the florist who sells the red roses to me, the bouquet means a sale of 500 rupees. When I present the bouquet to my wife, the red roses are a way of saying, I'm sorry, I forgot your birthday. And hopefully, for my wife, the red roses are a token of my love and affection, as well as an acceptance of my apology. It's obvious that teaching poetry is a challenging task. Why is it such a challenging, difficult pedagogic task? One. A poem may use words that are unusual, obscure, and archaic. So it's not always easy to teach at the elementary level, for example, to convince some learners that the sentence, thou art my God, simply means you are my God in current English. Two, a poem may use word order that is shockingly different from that of a prose text. The poet Thomas Hood used the phrase with fingers weary and worn, instead of the prose word order, with weary and worn fingers. The poet John Dryden used the inversion 
my dearest daughter, at your feet I fall, instead of the predictable prose word order, my dearest daughter, I fall at your feet. Three, a poem often contains complex thoughts. T.S. Eliot's monumental poem, The Wasteland, discusses ideas related to religion, death, and rebirth, and the waning influence of religious faith, particularly in the West, all of which are beyond the understanding of a school learner of English. Remember, we're talking about the teaching of uh, poetry at the school level. Four, why poetry can be challenging, a poem uses symbols and imagery. Now here are six lines from W.H. Davis's poem, The Rain. The Rain. I hear leaves drinking rain. I hear rich leaves on top, giving the poor beneath drop after drop. Tis a sweet noise to hear these green leaves drinking near. In this poem, Davis uses the symbol of rain to highlight the different classes of society. He does this by describing the way the upper leaves benefit from the rain first, and they then hand down the rest to the lower leaves. In the same way, the rich pass on the leftovers or the leftover benefits to the poor. So this poem is a good example of Robert Frost's definition of poetry. Poetry is saying one thing to mean another. Lastly, a poem may be culturally alien. This again is important for us teachers because if you find that a poem is found to be difficult to share with your children or that your children are not giving you the responses that you would have normally got from them, the reason could be that there is this sense of alienation as far as the content is concerned. Pat Mora, American poet, wrote a poem called Legal Alien, Legal Alien, 1975, which deals with the search for identity by Mexican Americans. So Mexicans, skilled Mexicans, by the way, not the illegal ones, who cross over into the United States of America and become legitimate citizens of the US. Now, Indian learners may find it difficult to fully comprehend this dual identity of Mexican Americans. Here are a few lines, not the whole poem. Legal alien, bilingual, bicultural, able to slip from house life to Mistan Volviendo Loca, able to sit in a paneled office drafting memos in smooth English, able to order in fluent Spanish at a Mexican restaurant. American, but hyphenated Mexican-American, viewed by Anglos as perhaps exotic, perhaps inferior, definitely different, viewed by Mexicans as alien. There I say, you may speak Spanish, but you're not like me. An American to Mexicans, a Mexican to Americans. So there are two lessons we can learn from what we have discussed so far. One, the choice of poems to teach at the school level is crucial. And two, poems were not written to be taught. So we're using something in our classrooms that was originally intended simply to be read in the privacy of our studies. 
Now you'll recall the third aim of teaching poetry that I mentioned at the beginning. We teach learners poetry in order to reinforce their sense of speech rhythm. Now let's briefly discuss this aspect now, speech rhythm. Did you notice that we use nursery rhymes at the kindergarten level to initiate children into English speech rhythm? Not surprisingly, Jack and Jill is a popular choice with pre-primary teachers. It has a regular beat that children can assimilate. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. So this very regular rhythm there, which you can pass on to your little children, provided you appreciate the way it is to be read, read out in the classroom. Now take a look at the poem, Song of the Train, that we sent you. Now please look at your uh, file um, and get the Song of the Train out, please. <coughs> Sorry. Have you got the poem out? Good. You'll notice that it's a train poem and it replicates the rhythm of a train that begins to move and then gather speed. So when you read out the poem in class, you'll need to reproduce the gathering speed of a moving train. Song of the Train. Clickety clack, wheels on the track. This is the way they begin the tack. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clackety, clickety clack. Clickety clack, riding in back, faster and faster, the song of the track. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clackety, clackety clack. Riding in front, over the crack, everyone hears the song of the track. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clickety clackety clack. Now that's an attempt at showing you how the speed begins to increase in a moving train. Right? You'll probably be wondering what it is that produces the regular rhythm in Song of the Train. Well, if you look at the poem now, the poem basically has lines of four syllables each. So look at the first two lines, right? Clickety clack seemingly is one word because it's hyphenated, but it's actually got four syllables. Click, a, uh, ter, and clack. The interesting thing there is the first syllable and the fourth syllable are stressed. Clickety clack. So it would be very unfair to the writer if you said clickety clack, stressing the second syllable, or worse still, clickety clack. Right? The second line, wheels on the track. Four syllables again. And the first syllable, wheels, is stressed. And the fourth syllable, track, is stressed. Wheels on the track. Right. Now, let me read out the other train poem we sent you. The World from a Railway Carriage, which I'm sure some of you at least have taught, because it's a popular inclusion in many textbooks, certainly in my textbooks. The world from a railway carriage. Could you please take it out of your file? <coughs> Sorry. Right. This well-known Stevenson poem 
evokes the steady rhythm of a moving train. So the train is already on the move. And it does this by using rhyme and predominantly lines of 10 syllables each. Are you ready to listen to it? The world from a railway carriage. Faster than fairies, faster than witches, bridges and houses, hedges and ditches, charging along like troops in a battle, all through meadows, the horses and cattle, all of the sights of the hill and the plain, fly as thick as driving rain, and ever again in the wink of an eye, painted stations whistle by. Here's a child who clamors and scrambles all by himself and gathering brambles. Here is a tramp who stands and gazes. There is the green for stringing the daisies. Here is a cart run away in the road, lumping along with man and load. And here is a mill and there is a river, each a glimpse and gone forever. That train ride has actually made me tired. Let us turn our attention to another poem, right? Before we do that, take a look at this picture. Now I'd like you to think of somebody, somebody special in our lives. Think of the mother in this picture and then think of your own mother. What words come to your mind when you think of this mother and your own mother? I'll give you 10 seconds to gobble together four or five attributes to describe your mother. <clears throat> okay, perhaps your short list contains some of these adjectives. Loving, caring, kind, considerate, devoted, affectionate, warm, friendly, tender, fond, adoring, hardworking, selfless, patient, and protective. Now hold these thoughts in your mind while I read out a poem titled On Mother's Day poem that we sent you along with the other handouts but do not look at it now put it back into the folder or turn it over so that you can't see the poem please right so do not look at the poem listen to the poem first on Mother's Day. <clears throat> On Mother's Day, we got up first, so full of plans, we almost burst. We started breakfast right away as our surprise for Mother's Day. We picked some flowers, then hurried back to make the coffee rather black. We wrapped our gifts and wrote a card and boiled the eggs a little hard. And then we sang a serenade, which burned the toast, I'm afraid. But mother said amidst our cheers, Oh, what a big surprise, my dears. I've not had such a treat in years. And she was smiling to her ears. Did you like the poem? I'm sure you did. Did you notice that the mother in this poem reflects the qualities you must have come up with earlier? 
Can you recall any words or phrases from the poem that I just read out to you? Perhaps you remember the phrases and words, Mother's Day, breakfast, flowers, eggs, toast, and so on. Now I'll read the poem a second time. Listen attentively and do not look at the poem, please. Here it is. On Mother's Day, we got up first, so full of plans, we almost burst. We started breakfast right away as our surprise for Mother's Day. We picked some flowers, then hurried back to make the coffee rather black. We wrapped our gifts and wrote a card and boiled the eggs a little hard. And then we sang a serenade, which burned the toast, I'm afraid. But mother said amidst our cheers, Oh, what a big surprise, my dears. I've not had such a treat in years. And she was smiling to her ears. This time, can you recall more words, more phrases, perhaps whole lines? Perhaps you can recall whole lines like the first line. On Mother's Day, we got up first. Right. Now, Take the poem out and look at it while I read it out a third time. So now, take the poem out, the handout out, please. Keep it in front of you. Look at it while I read the poem again. Are you ready? Now listen. On Mother's Day. On Mother's Day, we got up first, so full of plans, we almost burst. We started breakfast right away as our surprise for Mother's Day. We picked some flowers, then hurried back to make the coffee rather black. We wrapped our gifts and wrote a card and boiled the eggs a little hard. And then we sang a serenade, which burned the toast, I'm afraid. But mother said amidst our cheers, Oh, what a big surprise, my dears. I've not had such a treat in years. And she was smiling to her ears. Now look at the meaning of serenade. I've glossed it for you, right, in case... You are unsure about what it means. And also look at the little note I've attached to the poem about when Mother's Day is celebrated in the UK and in the USA. Right? I'll give you a minute. Read the poem silently. Right? Now read it silently. And I'll keep my mouth shut for a minute. Right. Now that you've read it, it's time to work on the comprehension questions I made for the poem. I assume at least some of you read the questions and answered those questions. Thanks for the effort. Did you notice 
that there aren't any simple, straightforward questions based on fact that you can easily retrieve from the poem. Some of them actually make you think and look closely at the text to obtain the answers. For example, there are two tricky parts in question one, right? And the question is, on Mother's Day, we got up first, first line. Who does we refer to? What do you think? Who do you think usually gets up first? Right. Who does we refer to? The pronoun we in the first line refers to the children. It does not include the mother. And that is significant understanding. In the second part of the question, we can infer that the mother usually gets up first right through the year, though the text does not explicitly say so. We make that valid assumption that 364 days of the year, it's the mother who wakes up first, but on Mother's Day, because it's a special day for her and for the children who celebrate it, to make sure that they, the children, get up first. So that is an important piece of inferring. Right? Now look at question four. Which of the gifts or surprises do you think gave mother the greatest pleasure? Now the responses to this question will vary. Some of you might say that giving mother breakfast in bed would give her the greatest pleasure. Some of you might choose serenading your mother as your response. The point is, there is no single correct answer. As you would uh, expect in traditional comprehension questions. So there'll be a variety of responses and each of those responses is valid. Look at the very last question. How can we honor and thank our mothers? Now this is what we call an application question, where the answer requires you to apply your appreciation of the poem in the form of a painting, a photograph, a song, or perhaps another poem, right? Now, before I outline what I did in an attempt to teach on Mother's Day, listen to the poem one last time. <clears throat> on Mother's Day. On Mother's Day, we got up first, so full of plans, we almost burst. We started breakfast right away as our surprise for Mother's Day. We picked some flowers, then hurried back to make the coffee rather black. We wrapped our gifts and wrote a card and boiled the eggs a little hard. And then we sang a serenade, which burned the toast, I'm afraid. But mother said amidst our cheers, oh, what a big surprise, my dears. I've not had such a treat in years. And she was smiling to her ears. Now, let me show you my plan for teaching a poem like on Mother's Day. I'm going to list seven or eight steps that you can possibly use when you teach a poem, roughly of the kind that I did with you. 
right? You might want to vary it depending on the poem itself, the level at which you're teaching, and so on. That's perfectly uh, understood. When you start a poetry lesson, introduce the theme of the poem. Now it's important to note that we should not jump straight into the poem by announcing, for instance, children, turn to page 55 and I'll teach you a new poem on Mother's Day. It would also help if we did not launch into a lengthy and scholarly lecture on the poet and the times that he or she lived in, because we're teaching school children and not postgraduates specializing in literature. So to appreciate on Mother's Day, we don't need a great deal of information about Eileen Fisher, the poet, right? What we perhaps need to know is, Fisher was a very popular children's writer, right? And she was born in um, 1906, I think, and uh, died in 2002, right? Or is the other way around. So she lived a nice long life and brought delight and pleasure to generations of uh, children. Right? She in fact contributed to making poetry popular in schools without intending to. So what we do require is a brief introduction to the theme of the poem. I used a photograph of a mother and child and prodded you into thinking about descriptive adjectives for mothers and children. On other occasions, I've used a poem about a mother as a thematic introduction. I've even used a video on mothers as a thematic introduction to On Mother's Day. And I do remember on a particular occasion in a poetry class about uh, mothers in general, I referred to uh, a British Council celebration of uh, 70 years of their uh, uh, founding uh, when they decided to put out a quiz as it were, not a quiz, a survey, but which 10 words are the most popular in English, right? And not surprisingly, number one was mother. Right? I don't have to tell you that father appeared nowhere in that first list of 10, right? We fathers don't seem to matter at all, right? Now, when you introduce a poem, you need to have a technique. So you might want to introduce it through individualized work. Something that I did with you a few minutes ago. So I showed you the picture of the uh, mother and child. And I said, think of a few words to describe this mother and your own mother. So since you're all sitting in 200 different venues, it actually became highly individualized. Now in a classroom, I might put you in pairs and say in each pair, could you come up with five attributes to describe your mother? And I'm going to give you two minutes to do this. I can do the same thing, putting you in groups of three, four or five and say, in about three or four minutes after discussion, I'd like you to finalize your choice of five words to describe a mother. And one of the easiest ways of doing it, which lots of uh, teachers generally employ, is to straight away ask a question like, 
why do we love our mothers, right? So a class discussion is clearly an option too. But my advice is vary your techniques, right? You can use one or more of these as you go along uh, dealing with the textbook, poetry in particular. Right? Step two. Read the poem aloud with the students' books shut. Right? Now, this is important. I introduced the theme, right? But I didn't quite tell you that I was going to use the picture of the mother and child to attempt the teaching of on Mother's Day. But what I did say was, look at the poem while I read it out. Now that's typically what teachers do and which is erroneous right so please do not ask your children to look at the poem when you're reading it out for the first time in fact the first two times right? so ask them to keep their book shut and you read it out and after you've read the poem out you can do two things one you can ask a global question and that is important i'll explain that in a moment a general question asking for an overview of the poem and two find out how many words or phrases or even lines that your children can recall maybe with a little help from you. Now think of this question, global question. You remember I asked you, did you like the poem? Now that's a question that obliges you to take an overview of the poem. I didn't say, which parts of the poem did you like? No, I said, did you like the poem? Right? What's the poem about? And after that, I said, I'm sure you can recall a few words and phrases like toast and breakfast and flowers, etc. Suggesting that the key to appreciating a poem begins with reading it aloud. Poetry is music and words. So start by making your students listen to the inherent rhythm, rhyme, alliteration, and assonance, and what have you, in a poem. At this stage, they only need to listen to the poem. Right? When you ask the class to recall any words, phrases, lines, etc., from your rendering of the poem, what you're doing, if you think about it, is uh, using an old trick to find out if your students were listening to you, right? And that's the most obvious way of checking if they've paid attention to you. Step three. Read the poem aloud again, right? So this is your second rendering. But remember, at this stage too, the students do not have their books open. They are not yet looking at the poem, right? Now, when you read the poem aloud a second time, you'll notice a perceptible increase in the learner's attentiveness because they heard you say after the first uh, round of reading aloud how many words and phrases can you recall children so now 
they guess correctly and say, ah, the teacher is going to ask the same question. Let me pay a little more attention so that I can answer her question if it comes up. So once children give you words, phrases, and even lines, you can actually help them rebuild the poem from memory, which means moving sequentially from line one to the last line. So you can prompt them so that they go in sequence and you'll notice after one or two rounds of such uh, a technique, they've actually memorized the poem by themselves. It's so much more fun doing this in class for children than the teacher telling the children, children, now that we've finished uh, studying this poem, I'd like you to go back home and memorize this poem. So when you come back tomorrow, I'd like you to recite it for me individually, please. Right? Now that's a boring piece of homework. It's so much more fun when you do it with them in class. Number four. Read the poem aloud yet again, but with the students following it in their books. Did you notice? This is a crucial step in the teaching of a poem. The learners now have their books open as you read the poem out a third time. And in the case of On Mother's Day, the poem that I uh, introduced you to, they notice that you're not pausing at the end of every line. Look at the poem, please. Look at the poem and observe how I read out lines one to six, in particular lines three to six. On Mother's Day, we got up first, so full of plans, we almost burst. We started breakfast right away as our surprise for Mother's Day. We pick some flowers, then hurried back to make the coffee rather black. Did you notice that I paused a little at the end of lines one and two, using the comma and the full stop as a guide? We got up first, pause, so full of plans we almost burst, pause. But I didn't pause at the end of line three and five, because it would be inappropriate to do so from the point of view of meaning. Lines three to six are what we call run-on lines. It's almost like prose, right? So let me read that little bit out for you. On Mother's Day, we got up first, so full of plans, we almost burst. We started breakfast right away as our surprise for Mother's Day. We picked some flowers, then hurried back to make the coffee rather black, right? Now, this round of reading aloud enables the coupling of two senses, the auditory sense, and the visual sense, right? So children are listening to you and looking at the poem, which they didn't do in the earlier two phases. So the ears and the eyes are working in tandem. Right? Most importantly, this step should remind you of how crucial it is to practice reading aloud the poem at home before you get to the classroom in school. 
because generally speaking, teachers will have planned to teach a new poem like on Mother's Day, later that day or the next day, and they'll read through the poem silently. And particularly when it comes to the comprehension questions, they'll uh, write out or scribble the answers to each question in the margin. And when there's a teacher's book, as in the case of my own books, the answers are already available. So they'll copy the answers out in the margins and say, I'm ready now. You're not really ready because you missed out on one important part of preparation, which is reading aloud. So I don't hesitate to tell uh, uh, my teacher trainees, the best thing to do is what I used to do. If I ever wanted to uh, teach a poem at a workshop, I would prepare obviously on the content, but I also made it a point to practice reading it out. Now, the first couple of times I did that sitting in the drawing room, I wasn't a very popular person. The family didn't quite understand why it was that I was reading out something to myself. Why can't this man read it silently? Or better still go to the bedroom and read it, right? So what I would do is, go to the bathroom, close the door, pick up the biggest bucket, put it under the tap, open the tap, right? Sit on the toilet seat with my poem in hand and practice reading it out. The noise of the, uh, the sound of the running water obviously got rid of any kind of problems that I might have had with my relatives, with the family. So apart from the fact that that's not just the way to do it, please do take reading aloud seriously, right? Poetry is music in words and music is meant to be heard, right? Step five, ask the class to study the poem silently. So you remember I told you, take a minute to read the poem on your own and I'll keep my mouth shut, right? Now, I also said, remember, look at the word serenade, look at the note, etc., because this is the stage when we want to encourage our learners to look at the additional editorial work that the textbook writer has done. And if you think the glossary is inadequate for your own class, please add to it. One teacher who uh, taught this form can, came back to me uh, with her uh, experience some years ago said, Surprisingly, sir, because I teach in one of the suburban schools, they had never heard of toasted bread. Bread, yes, right? But toasted bread and the concept of a toaster was still not familiar to them. So you might want to uh, explain what toasted bread is, right? Now, this is the silent reading phase where the learners directly interact with the poem. So when they begin reading the poem, remind them about the gloss that's available, right? And the note. And the note is important because Eileen Fisher, the poet, was an American children's writer, right? So Mother's Day in this poem is observed on the second Sunday of May in the US. And I'm sure many of you must have celebrated Mother's Day uh, last month. Step six.
This is the phase that's traditionally been regarded as the core of a poetry lesson. Generally speaking, the poems that are included in many prescribed books are meaty, substantial content and contain ideas, thoughts, feelings that are substantial enough to be explored through comprehension questions that are attached uh, to the poems. Now, content is what we have dealt with already, but let's look at structure briefly. Some traditional poems have a formal structure, particularly at the secondary level and senior secondary level. Structure becomes important. Shakespeare is as well known for the memorable plays he wrote as he is for the wonderful 154 sonnets he wrote. If you were therefore teaching Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, you'd want to tell your students that a sonnet is a poem that has 14 lines, each containing 10 syllables and a fixed pattern of rhyme. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, right? So 12 lines plus two lines, a clincher as it were, in uh, a Shakespearean sonnet, which is different, obviously, from a Petrarchan uh, sonnet. Right. As an example of what this structure means, let me actually read out to you <clears throat> Sonnet 18, Shakespeare's Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course, untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this life gives life to thee. Famous poem. Right? Now take a look at the Bangle Sellers. We sent you a copy of the uh, Bangle Sellers. Could you get it out, please? You'll notice that Sarojini Naidu's poem has a perceptible structure, right? Bangle sellers are we who bear our shining loads to the temple fair. Who will buy these delicate, bright, rainbow-tinted circles of light? Lustrous tokens of radiant lives for happy daughters and happy wives. Right, now the first stanza is an introduction. The speakers, the bangle sellers, tell you that they have brought their wares to sell at the temple fair and that they have bangles for women in different age groups. The second stanza, and I won't read it out, the second stanza focuses on bangles suitable for maidens, that is, young, unmarried women. And the colors highlighted are silver, blue, and green. The third stanza refers to bangles that are appropriate for young women who are about to get married. 
the bright yellow of the corn that is about to be harvested and is therefore stressed. And the fourth stanza is about the bangle suitable for women who have journeyed through life midway. Lovely line. That is middle-aged women. And so the poet emphasizes the more subdued colors associated with middle age, purple and gray. In essence, the poet has most skillfully linked bangles of different colors with three stages in the life of a woman. Right, now let's quickly study five kinds of comprehension questions that we can deploy to help our learners not just understand a poem like on Mother's Day, but also appreciate it as a unique literary creation. <clears throat> this kind, factual comprehension. Factual comprehension questions require responses based on explicitly stated details in the poem. A good factual question will demand application of the mind, and we looked at it earlier in the discussion. The first question on Mother's Day, we caught up first. Who does we refer to? So we there is a pronominal reference to speakers in the poem, but does not include the mother, and that's significant. The second kind of comprehension question is the inferential kind. Inferential questions require responses based on information that has only been implicitly stated. So if factual questions largely deal with literal meaning and what we call denotation in a poem, inferential questions direct the reader's attention to figurative meaning and connotation. So think of the question, who do you think gets up first? To decide that it's the mother who gets up first requires the reader to infer that children getting up first is only a one-off event on Mother's Day. Evaluative comprehension question. Now, evaluative comprehension questions require the reader to make judgments about the characters and events in a poem. The question, is this poem different from your own mother? That question makes you assess the mother in the poem vis-a-vis -vis your own mother in relation to your own mother and significantly there'll be divergent responses when you ask learners to assess a character. So there'll be a convergence, as it were, of all the responses for factual and inferential questions. <coughs> but there will be a distinct divergence of responses when it comes to looking at character, for instance. Right? Now, why is this particular kind of question important. If you recall that um, famous film, a film, Cholet, right? 1975, was it? Right. So popular that they celebrated 25 years of uh, its release later. And it was a roaring success again at the box office. Now, one of the reasons why that film was so popular was the characterization and, of course, the plot. But interestingly, 
when they had a survey to find out which character in the film the viewers liked the best, the choice was overwhelmingly in favor of Gambar Singh, right? Now in the classroom, you're discussing character that your choice of an answer is not quite the choice of an answer from the student or students. It doesn't mean only you are right and they are wrong. It only means they are looking at the same character, the same plot in terms of their own experience, right? So word of uh, caution. An evaluative comprehension question is most desirable in the classroom because it evokes a great deal of discussion. It's a wonderful uh, tool to get children to respond in terms of their own uh, views. But it can be a little tricky if you put it into your test paper or exam paper, because then unless you're trained to be open-minded and accept answers that are at variance with the answer key provided by the board, let's say, children will be in trouble. So let's make a distinction between questions meant for teaching and questions meant for testing, right? Not that I'm against evaluation, not at all. In fact, that's something that I regularly done in my kind of uh, testing, but I thought I should caution you about it. Number five and penultimate question type is the extrapolative comprehension question. Extrapolative comes from extrapolate and extrapolation. And these are questions that generally require the reader to extrapolate from their comprehension of the poem or part of the poem to their own experiences thereby obliging them to offer very often highly personalized responses. So when you ask that question attached to on Mother's Day, what can we do to honor and thank our mothers? It will persuade the reader to think of their own mother and think of some very creative and innovative ways of saying, thank you, mom. Right, and each one of those extrapolations is valid. Right, so that's why we call it a personal response question and very important when it comes to teaching literature. Last comprehension is the global comprehension question, where the word coherence, for instance, refers to taking a general overview of the piece of writing, right? So it's like a bird's eye view. You're taking a look at a house, for instance, from up there in the clouds and saying, oh, this is what my house looks like, right? As opposed to going into each room and saying, ah, this room is nice and that garden is nice, etc." right? So global questions, direct the attention of the reader to the whole text. A simple question like, what's the poem about? Obliges the reader to think about the text in general and what the theme of the poem is. So generally, a global question appears at the beginning of the poetry lesson because the answer to a global question shows the teacher whether the learners have at least a rough idea of the overriding theme of the text. If, as a teacher, you feel that the questions attached to a poem in a textbook, uh, your textbook, is inadequate, please add to those questions. Supplement what is there in the textbook with your own questions, you know your children best. 
as a textbook writer, I don't, right? I try out my materials, yes, before it goes into print, but it's a limited trial run, right? So please feel free to add to the questions that you find in a textbook, depending on, of course, the level of proficiency of your own class. Number seven. <clears throat> Read the poem aloud again or have it read out. Right? You remember I did that with you? We finished that little demo session with me reading out the poem to you. And you must have said, oh my God, when is this chap going to stop reading this poem out? He's done it four times already. Right? But there is a reason. At this stage, you reconstitute the poem. Right? In step six, in the comprehension phase, we dissected the poem, didn't we? Right? We ask questions like, who generally wakes up first? Where's the proof for, the, for your response, children? Who does we refer to, etc.? These are all ways in which you're actually going deeper and deeper into the details. And if you suddenly say, finished, the last question's been honored, uh, answered, uh, it's time for us to go back home, children, right? Thank you very much for a patient uh, uh, listening to the lesson. You still haven't completed your lesson. Put the poem back into the form you found it in the first place. So we owe it to the poet to restore the poem to its pristine form. And the best restoration strategy is to read it out again. The last step. Read out a thematically similar poem if possible. But remember, the theme by itself is not good enough. You might find a variety of uh, poems that deal with mothers, but the levels will vary, right? So if you're teaching on Mother's Day, let's say in class six, find a poem that deals with motherhood, which is roughly comparable with the difficulty level or the challenge posed by on Mother's Day. That's your decision and it's part of uh, lesson preparation, right? Since I'm dealing with adults, 200 of you, and the theme today is mothers, let me read aloud one of my favorite mother poems, right? So now please take a look at your copy of Night of the Scorpion. <clears throat> Have you got it out? Right. Night of the Scorpion. I remember the night my mother was stung by a scorpion. Ten hours of steady rain had driven him to crawl beneath a sack of rice. Parting with his poison, flash of diabolic tail in the dark room, he risked the rain again. The peasants came like swarms of flies and buzzed the name of God a hundred times to paralyze the evil one. With candles and with lanterns, throwing giant scorpion shadows on the mud-baked walls, they searched for him. He was not found. They clicked their tongues. With every movement that the scorpion made, 
His poison moved in mother's blood, they said. May he sit still, they said. May the sins of your previous birth be burned away tonight, they said. May your suffering decrease the misfortunes of your next birth, they said. May the sum of all evil balanced in this unreal world against the sum of good become diminished by your pain. May the poison purify your flesh of desire and your spirit of ambition, they said. And they sat around on the floor with my mother in the center, the peace of understanding on each face. More candles, more lanterns, more neighbors, more insects, and the endless rain. My mother twisted through and through, groaning on a mat. My father, skeptic, rationalist, trying every curse and blessing, powder, mixture, herb, and high fruit. He even poured a little paraffin upon the bitten toe and put a match to it. I watched the flame feeding on my mother. I watched the holy man perform his rites to tame the poison with an incantation. After twenty hours, it lost its sting. My mother only said, Thank God the scorpion picked on me and spared my children. Right. Let me show you quotations in conclusion. Poetry begins in delight and ends in wisdom, Robert Frost. So I hope you enjoyed the session. Hope it brought you some delight and maybe a wee bit of wisdom. The second quotation is a wonderful extract from C. D. Lewis, who himself was a lovely poet, right? Who's talking about what happens to poetry in the hands of a craftsman what happens to language in the hands of a creative writer. If you're at the seaside and you take an old brown penny and rub it hard for a minute or two with handfuls of wet sand, dry sand is no good, the penny will come out a bright gold color looking as clean and new as the day it was minted. Now, poetry has the same effect on words as wet sand on pennies. In what seems almost a miraculous way, it brightens up words that looked dull and ordinary. 